So welcome back everybody. My name's Andrew and you're watching the Kelly's Country Life. If this is your first time visiting the channel. Thanks so much for stopping by. We do DIY videos often. All right, so I won't talk too much on this because we want to dive in and get to work, right? But this is the series that a lot of people have been waiting on for, well, almost a year. I've got a lot of comments here lately, people asking, when are we going to finish out the loft in the house and do all the custom built stair railings, stairs, all that stuff? Well, that starts today in this episode. This is going to be a several part series that goes over the next several weeks as I try to figure out and build my first ever set of floating stairs is what we've decided on, as well as all metal railing. This is going to be really fun. I'm excited about it, but it's also going to be a challenge to me and my tools because I'm working well with some very large steel here. All right, so let me explain what the heck I'm doing here with this odd size lumber. So believe it or not, here we are down in Florida. So South Georgia, North Florida, probably the southern pine capital of, well, the world and yellow southern pine wood is what we have throughout our house with our tongue groove pine and also i wanted to match the staircase and landing platform wood to look like that went to lowe's none of my lows i went to georgia and to uh, florida north florida could not find pine two by fours anywhere everything was imported in from Canada, whitewood. Well, that doesn't match anything in the house. The only thing I could find yellow pine in was two by sixes, two by eights, and two by tens. So I'm actually gonna have to rip down two by eights to try to come up with close to a three inch stair tread thickness is what I'm wanting. This gives me room to work with. So that's why you're about to see me do a whole bunch of cutting and ripping down. It's simply because I couldn't find the materials that I needed. So now that I have to do a bunch of repeat 36 inch cuts, I am going to set up my salt stand right here to do that. Needless to say, by the end of this project, I bet I am going to change out my table saw and chop saw blade. All right, so now the plan is to rip these in half and then I'll trim off the edges. So essentially I'm making a lot of cuts per piece. This is a very painstaking and time consuming process, but it's gonna get me nice flush squared off edges to where we can sand and plane down and make a good looking laminated piece of wood. If we were to slap everything together right now with, well, rough busted edges like that, these rounded over edges that come from factory, none of this would look good. It wouldn't look good at all. All right, so now that I have all these boards ripped down and trimmed close to the size that I want, I need to run them through my planer right here and get each side smooth because we're ultimately gonna be gluing these together and if I don't get good contact, well, the glue is just not gonna stick. So if you take a look at this wood, because, well, it's just regular old sawmill lumber, it's got big lips and gashes like that where the saw blade went through it, things like this, like that is not gonna bond and stick correctly to the next piece of wood that I glue onto the side. So run it through the planer should give me a nice smooth surface for gluing. By the way, this isn't a sponsored video, but I'll let y'all know in the last video that I used this and I'm gonna let y'all know again because it's as cheap as I've ever seen. The company I got this from over a year ago, Vivor, this planer right now is like 200 and something dollars on a sale that they're having. They're running a shop campaign with all kinds of shop tools and stuff. And I have been telling everybody I can think of about it because this is a steal at 200 and something dollars for a 12 and a half inch planer. I just, I don't know of anybody else that sells anything anywhere near that cheap. And it's been 100% bulletproof for me for the last year plus that I've used it.
So take a look at this. This is that same piece that gouge is up here somewhere, completely gone. Nice and smooth, ready for glue to bond to it after a couple quick passes through that planer. All right, so now it's time to glue these together. And even though I'm trying to make a 36 inch wide platform, I'm going to only do these 12 inches or 11 and a half inches at a time. 10 inch and a half wide boards, 11 and a half inches. And the reason I'm gonna do that is that way I can take these three individual pieces after they set up and glue together overnight and I'll run them through the planer one more time again tomorrow to make sure all the top edges are nice and flush. That planer will make far quicker work than I can coming back with a hand sander over a gigantic piece. Then I'll have three sections that I'll glue together, do my final fit and finish there. Now I wanna make sure I get plenty of glue on this. And what is really important as well, get, so get your old you know, foam applicator brush and get it nice and smooth across all of the surface. Don't just pour it on and call that good. Then you're only gluing just a little bit of sections. I even considered screwing these together or running all thread through, but the way I'm gonna build this landing platform, this piece is gonna sit on top of a metal frame, so it's gonna be supported quite well. And people often underestimate how strong wood glue is. It is extremely strong. All right, so I've got a nice even layer of glue right there for those two. I'll just keep repeating this process. We'll clamp it together. So the whole point of us taking the time to plane down both sides of the wood like I did is so we have two very flat surfaces to bond together. Now you're gonna see these, bow, these boards are gonna be bowed and all. We're gonna work that out with clamps, but I want a nice flat smooth surface because what a lot of people don't realize is these boards can have a cup in them like that too. A lot of times you'll run this through a planer and you'll see it take off one edge or the other. So if you do a couple quick passes through on both sides, we know we've worked down any cup in the board and got a flat surface. Because if it was cup, well, you'd only have two small areas actually making contact with this next board. Long story short, we just got to get a very, very strong glued joint. That is exactly 12 inches. My planer is 12 and a half inches. So I have to stop right there. So I just went and bought me a bunch of wood clamps. As much as we all know, Harbor Freight does not make quality stuff. They do have very affordable clamps whenever you need to buy a pile of them for a project like this. I got all these clamps for like $5 a piece or something. Now some of those wood strips that I ripped off the edges out there, I'm gonna put on the sides because you don't wanna just put your clamp on the board, go to tighten it down. This is soft pine. You would come back tomorrow, loosen these clamps and have mushed in holes everywhere on these boards. And that's not what we want. I'm not overly concerned about how flush I get the ends. We're just gonna get them close because we're ultimately gonna get all this glued together, plane down the top and bottom so it's nice and smooth. And we're gonna trim the ends off to get everything perfect. All right, and you'll see I've set a couple pieces of uh, steel up over here. I'm gonna transfer this to that. I know that's a nice flat surface. It's not gonna flex dip or bow like this wood will. And I'll let these sit up on the rack. I'll do some minor adjustments with the mallet, get everything as close as I can. Again, we're gonna take care of all that with a sander and planer. And I'll let this sit up overnight on this rack dry. Okay, so it is next morning. We're gonna unclamp these. Then I'm just gonna take an old chisel here, remove the bulk of all this wood glue that squeezed out on both sides, because there's no point in running that through my planer when I can easily take it off right here. All right, so this right here is about to really test out this planer. Pretty much a full pass and cutting. I'm just gonna work it through many different times little by little. 
just slowly working it through and listening to the planer. Try not to put it too much behind. Okay, so now that I've spent the time planing these down and getting them all roughly the same thickness so they'll go together as what appears to be one continuous piece, I am going to bring these over here to my chop saw. Man, I hope this works. This is where I would love to have a little bit bigger chop saw, miter saw, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to square off the ends. I have left these long enough that I can do some trimming to cut out bad ends, irregularities, glue, all that stuff. Okay, now my end is nice and smooth, and this polishes the wood too, and I'll go back and hit it with some sandpaper here at the very end. And you see this is the end that has all the bad knots, which I don't mind some knots. That gives character to wood. I prefer some, but I don't want big hollow cavities. So that's what we're going to cut out. May not can get it all. No big deal. We'll rearrange these to where we can hide them. <laughs> That's a hunk of wood to cut through. Awesome. Only a tiny little chunk that I couldn't get to. No big deal. All right, so I'm going to cut these other two, and then, well, we glue them together again, wait another night, do a final sanding. I'll show you all that. I'll see you back. Okay, so it is now next day. What I'm gonna do is pop all these clamps off. We'll kind of look everything over, get this outside. And we have a few small high spots and wood glue, things like that. We're gonna go sand down and we're gonna look for any gaps that we couldn't close up too. I've got a special filler for that. Holy smokes, this thing got heavy, y'all. Huh? Super heavy. All right, so here's where it's just sand, sand, and well, sand some more. I'll go ahead and take the wood glue off with this chisel. Okay, so whenever you laminate wood like this, it's pretty much inevitable, especially just working with old typical lumber like I was, but it's inevitable that you're going to wind up with some holes, some gaps that need filling. I mean, technically I could go ahead and coat this and just live with some of the gaps. You may not notice them as much as you think. It's more kind of quick here. This stuff dries quickly. I just like to go along, push it in those cracks, get the majority off that I can. That'll help with uh, 
all the sanding that I got to do later. There's pretty good gap up top right here on this piece, so we're going to get it filled. And you want to leave it slightly mounted if you can, because you're going to sand this down. And I'll work around, long, do that, fill any holes like that right there. Actually, that already looks awesome. And this stuff will literally dry in a few minutes. I'll come back and sand this with some 220 grit. Done. Okay, so these six stair treads right here have been clamped for about 24 hours. I'm gonna take them apart. I just put two together at a time. And I gotta clean all of this glue off. And because the boards are uneven, we're gonna have to trim the ends. Uh, I made sure I made my stair treads wider than needed anyways to do trimming off both ends. And we need to run these through the planer to get everything down nice and smooth because it's really inconsistent right now. Another thing to note is I made my stairs thicker than I wanted to by, I think it was about an eighth of an inch if I remember correctly because I knew I'd be running them through the planer and taking about a sixteenth off of both sides. We don't have to be exact here, but I just had an idea in mind where I wanted my stairs to wind up thickness wise, my stair treads. All right, so before we wrap this episode up by poly coating all the wood right here, I want to talk about something with you. So earlier in the episode, you heard me talk about going to get some stain. I'm gonna be honest with you, I wasted way too much time, went to multiple stores, a couple different towns, got custom mixed stains. I could not find nothing I was happy with. And ultimately we've decided to poly coat this pine as you see it. So the reason why pine and any of your woods, you'll notice that they age with time. They tend to yellow or amber up. And that's because of the reaction happening with the tannins inside, the pigments, turpentines, things such as that. Um, they oxidize basically. And you get some interaction with ultraviolet as well. So I really had to step back and think about that. And I'm telling you this because maybe it'll help you with your project in the future. So if you look at this pine right here, how wide it is, that's because I have planed it down, cut it and sanded it, and basically brought it back to its uh, original non-oxidized state because I've taken that all off the surface. So look right here at this piece. This is exactly the same pieces as this before this has already been cut and plain, so I've taken a lot off of this, but this is before sanding. You see the difference there? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but I can definitely see it. This is already a little more yellow, more of the hue that we're looking for that matches what's going on in the house. This right here is, well, a piece of pine that I bought months ago and has been sprayed on with a poly coat. This is heavily oxidized, and not to mention what I keep forgetting is that polyurethane, most of them have what's called an ambering effect. So I just found that out recently by looking at some different types of polys at my Sherwin-Williams store. Turns out there's only just a handful that are truly clear. Most people think of clear coat, we call it polyurethane. Well, a lot of them actually are tinted and already have an amber effect to them. So look at this pine right here. This is what everything in the house looks like. It started like this, it ultimately winds up aging like this and with poly coat, which this has over it, it's ambered even more. So I said all that to say, if you've got a project and you're going for a specific look, sometimes you try to go ahead and force that look by staining and you don't take time to realize 
This is not what we're going for right now, but we have to be patient and wait because this is exactly what it's going to look like after just a few months of being in the house. All right, so let me tell you about my setup real quick. People are always curious about that. I'm using a Graco Project Painter Plus. It's kind of their entry level machine here as far as the airless sprayers go. And I've had this thing a long time, 12, 15 years, it's been excellent. But it does lack the pump and the pressure to run through a fine tip. So I have to run a large open tip for something like a polyurethane. Ultimately what that means is I wind up wasting a little and it goes on really heavy. So I have to be careful and watch the way that I spray. I've got all my stair treads flipped upside down as well as my landing. And I always spray the bottom side first. That way, whenever you go to flip them later, if there is any damage putting them on the wood, it's typically, the bottom side's an area you don't see. But I gotta be careful. The reason I have spent so much extra time sanding the bottoms, and I'm gonna be very careful with spraying is because about half the stair treads and the landing platform, because these are floating stairs, you'll be able to see from underneath. So I need to treat this all like it's fully gonna be exposed. Now I'm using a Minwax floor polyurethane. It's supposed to be a little more durable, harder supposedly and it is a satin. I'm a big believer in satin. I do not like the semi-glosses or glosses. They, they show blemishes way too much. The satin always comes out nice and clear. So that's what we're going with on this project. So I'm gonna put one relatively thick coat on, try to catch some of the edges as I work around, but mainly focus on the bottom because on a vertical surface like my edges, if you spray that heavy, well, guess what? That's where you get your run. So. The way I'm gonna aim this is a heavy coat on top, light overspray on the sides, because once I flip these uh, later on and spray the top, I'll do the same thing again. So the sides and all the vertical surfaces are technically gonna get two coats, and we'll make sure we get a nice even coat on that. Okay, I gotta make sure I get y'all a close up of this. I always do one quick look, make sure I don't see dry spots. Holy smokes. I'm so glad I didn't stain because every time I spray this stuff, this is definitely an amberine effect polyurethane. It just turned it such a beautiful golden color. Just about what I'm looking for. Watch this. I'm gonna go ahead and spray this uh, landing platform right here. Watch as it ambers it right up. And there's always bugs and stuff that's gonna light right in this too. Look at that beautiful color. I love that this polyurethane ambers up. So you gotta keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out what color you're looking for. I'll spray from high, nice and quick. Do not want runs. We can always put a second coat. Give it one quick look. Make sure I don't see any dry spots. I see one tiny dry spot right here. Hit that real quick. Perfect. Oh, that color looks so good. So I forgot to mention before I started spraying, I wiped all of these down. The last thing you want to do is spend all the time that you did sanding and getting everything perfect just to leave sawdust on it and it be bumpy and gritty. You can see that when you put a clear coat on it. Prep is everything with stuff like this. Okay, so now we just let this dry and after it dries, per the manufacturer's instructions, you can go back with some 220 grit, sand down any high spots. Uh, you can also sand and put a second coat on if you want it to be really durable. Being that we don't wear shoes in the house, this is an area that's not gonna be heavily used, always gonna be walked on with socks. I honestly trust one good heavy coat, but you need to change that based on the conditions in your house. All 
All right, well, what a long journey it's been to get to this point right here. You're literally looking at well over a week's worth of time of planing, gluing, clamping, sanding, 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 more planing to get rough cut two by lumber down to a good usable and smooth finish for a nice smooth poly coat. Now with that said, I would do this again in a heartbeat, even though it was really more work than I considered it to be. And that's because when you look at what I have in all this with the poly coat and all this two by lumber, I think I'm a little over $300. And then you look at these several thousand dollars it would cost online to order this in, the payback was absolutely worth it to spend the over a week to get all this to this point. So with that said, I've got one thick coat on the bottom, that's fine. We just got the wood colored that way and sealed up. And I did two coats on this. I forgot to mention that was a fast drying Minwax. It said in three plus hours, you could recoat. And I waited that long till we were no longer tacky, um, but not completely dry to do my recoat. It has turned out beautiful, other than a few little bugs that I've had to pick out of it, but that's just the way it goes. All right, hopefully y'all enjoyed that. So just to let everybody know, what I'm now about to do is start spending a tremendous amount of time doing metal work in the shop we still want to work toward getting our landing platform complete but i need to use that landing platform out in the shop to stage my beam and get my stair tread plates and things like that nice and level before we disassemble it carry it in the house so next episode will be all that metal work and us finishing up the landing platform we'll continue to move forward from there thank y'all so much for watching catch you on the next video